there, Alaskans, wherever you are. Welcome to the Must Read Alaska Show. Coming to you from somewhere in Alaska. This is the place where we talk about, you guessed it, Alaska. Where we keep the mainstream media on their toes and where we are standing up for what's right in a world run by leftists. You can find out more by heading over to mustreadalaska.com and also checking out the Must Read Alaska YouTube channel for some really great content. But first, let's get this party started. So welcome, everybody. Welcome aboard the Must Read Alaska show, coming to you from somewhere in Alaska. And it's, um, you know, it's really a great day. We're actually recording it uh, on Facebook this morning. We're trying something a little bit different. John Quick, my host, and I are, have, have decided that we'll do a few more live shows on Facebook and sort of drift into that direction. So we're just kind of excited about trying something different. And John, you're in the Kiski. So what's going on in the Kiski today? Well, thanks so much, Suzanne. Man, in Nikiski, we have gotten so much snow, it's getting a little ridiculous. If I could show, I'm not going to because I don't want to mess up my internet here, but if I could show you a picture of our outdoor uh, back porch sliding glass door, the snow is literally almost up to the very top of the window because... uh, well, well the, last we have, time you, the last time you showed it to me, it was halfway up the window and it was like working its way up toward the eaves. And, <laughs> and the last time we talked, you were on top of your roof shoveling snow. Oh, my gosh. Talk about a workout. You think you're in shape. Well, just go on your roof for, you know, two, three hours and shovel snow off the off the back sides and front of your roof. And you'll figure out pretty quickly if you're in shape or not. I, apparently, I was not in shape. So... <laughs> Good thing you have relatives to help out. That's all I can say. <laughs> yep. Well, we've got a great little show today, and we're gonna. Uh, is there anything else going on in the Kiski that you wanted to mention besides the snow snow apocalypse? Well, uh, still the the uh, the exciting news for us is Mayor Pierce of the borough is um, still running for governor. He has not yet announced his lieutenant governor, which you know can be tricky in this stage of the game because a lot of those well qualified candidates are actually in session. And so, um, you know, you, you're probably weighing who, who he's going to pick. I don't think he has to pick somebody till June 1st. But um, I think in general, people on the peninsula are excited. Um, and he is a guy that's going to get out there and really connect with people. I think that's what probably sets him apart and why people like him on the peninsula is that Mayor Pierce has the ability to just connect with the average Alaskan person and say a lot of things that people are thinking, but maybe don't feel like they have the platform or the bandwidth or the influence to say to affect change. He'll get out there and say it and get it done. Two of the things that I really love about Charlie Pierce that I've talked to, you know, on this show before is that um, he ran five years ago uh, on two promises. He's, he's been there for two terms and on the borough, it's three years apiece. But he really just ran on two promises. Um, one promise was that he would not increase the mill rate, which for those of you that are listening that don't know what that means, that basically just means the property tax. Okay. He wouldn't increase the main property tax in the borough, and he would end with more money than he started. It's, and those are pretty hefty promises to make because you and I both know that Republicans, Democrats, whoever it is, they usually get in there and drink the Kool-Aid, you know, in five minutes. And and next thing you know, they're increasing taxes. Well, he will have been a two-term mayor without increasing the mill rate once and with ending more money than he started within the bank, which is a very, uh, you know, feather in the cap moment for him. So we're proud of him here on the peninsula. Yeah. And I understand that he was up in Anchorage a couple of days ago at the Kathy Hensley event, which I did not go to, and that he made a lot of friends up there. Uh, the challenge for these uh, candidates right now is that they, you know, they've got to, it used to be that you would run independently. And then sometime in late August, after the primary, you would be kind of married up with your running mate. That was, it's kind of unusual, but that's the way it's put together in the Alaska constitution. Now, ballot measure two threw all that out. And says and, and says you now run with your running mate. You pick your running mate and then you run. So, for instance, with Bill Walker and um, Heidi Dragas, she is uh, married to him for you know, she's been for a year and a, and a half now. It'll be a yep. year and a half by the end of the thing. So that they're together the whole time. You have to find somebody that you're really compatible 
with running and you're not going to get on each other's nerves. Same way with Chris Kirka and Paul Huber. They're going to run together for six, eight months or well, you know, at least through the primary and we'll see how they do after that. And you, hopefully they won't blow each other up. I mean, it's, it's a tricky thing because you've got to find somebody that you can get along with in a really intense environment. So you take a look at um, the, the, the field. And like you say, some of these people are in session. They, unless they drop out, they can't run or they can't raise money. And you're going to need somebody who's a good fundraiser as well. who can raise money for you. They're not going to sandbag you, quite honestly. So it's tricky because uh, they will be uh, together for a long time in, in this political term. Now, I, I, I've heard that Shelley Hughes was under consideration, and I don't know where that's at. I know that she is the majority leader in the Senate, and she enjoys her, her role there. We'll see what happens with that. There are other people. But what's really interesting to me is that everybody's talking about women lieutenant governor candidates. And I find that to be really interesting. Ever since Kamala Harris became vice president, the trend in our state for the, the, next, the next cycle is you got to have a woman. And I don't quite understand why you would have to have a woman. Why not just get a completely qualified candidate? I would love to have a candidate for Charlie Pierce, for instance, and, and also for um, Mike Dunleavy, somebody who really, really is interested in elections and making sure elections are, uh, they restore the confidence of the public. And the, the confidence has been shaken dramatically, John, because we not only have this crazy system that we're going into with sort of a wild, it's called the jungle primary in August, where everybody's on the same ballot. And then it moves into a rank choice voting in the fall. Now, if you rank choice in, in August, you're going to spoil your ballot and your, your vote won't count. If you mix yourself up and you vote wrong, it's not binary in, um, in, in the fall, though. It's like rank one, two, three, four type of a thing. So I find it fascinating that we are moving into a situation where both Charlie and, and Mike Dunleavy have to find a candidate and everybody keeps talking about women. And that narrows the field, really it does. I mean, it really narrows the field to well, what do you, instead of the, well, we have what, 730,000 people. So now you've cut that in half uh, dramatically. Yeah, and it's... Um... It's an interesting ask, I think, for a lieutenant governor because you have to find somebody who's very successful and then you have to tell them, hey, listen, <laughs> you want to leave your job for you know nine months to a year and uh, come run with me. And you know we have this ranked choice voting system, so who knows who's going to win? And so yeah. I'm, my guess is you have Team Dunleavy, Team Pierce kind of having to really – put their head to the piece of paper and, and find somebody who is willing to kind of give everything up for nine months and run with them. And that pool is very small in Alaska. We're not, this is not, you know, Washington or California where you have a million people on that list. We, we, they probably have, you know, a short list of 50 people or less. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, maybe a couple dozen. And so, they and these are the people in the same party, and so they probably they probably asked several people. Both both candidates have probably asked the same several people multiple times, and it's just we don't have a big pool in Alaska, so it'll be interesting to see who Dunleavy and and Pierce pick for their running mate. Yeah, interesting indeed. Yeah, well, it is um, something that we're going to be keep, keeping an eye on because that will in, in normal campaigns, the lieutenant governor really doesn't, that doesn't really feel like it influences votes that much. But we're going into, a, like I said, a cycle where we've never done this before. We don't know if a lieutenant governor can influence the voters. Now, I will tell you this much. If you put a Bernadette Wilson on the ballot with either of those guys, they would win. Either one, they would win with Bernadette Wilson as a lieutenant governor candidate because she's a fireball. She's running the Americans for Prosperity now. I'm sure she's not interested. She's already got her issues that she's working on. But you know, you, if you found a dynamo like that, it could move the needle for you. But other than that, in history, uh, if history informs us today on ranked choice, this ranked choice environment, uh, the lieutenant governor candidate ultimately doesn't matter. It's just kind of a, it's kind of a, 
thing that happens. You, you pick your lieutenant governor candidate and then we'll see. But with ranked choice voting, it'll be a different game. Now, I wanted to turn our topic to something else because yesterday we had a new candidate enter the race for U.S. Congress. So finally, the Democrats have somebody that they're willing to put up for U.S. Congress, and that's Chris Constant. We know him well at Must Read Alaska because he attacks our blog very often. And uh, when we we give it right back to him, um, he's a Democrat's Democrat, very, very hard left on the Anchorage Assembly. Um, when you sit down with Chris, he's, you know, he could be a likable guy, but he's very moody. He's very sensitive. He's got the thinnest skin on the planet. And I, I just wonder how he's going to do. I noticed that he is using the blue wave strategies, political partners, blue wave political partners, I think it's called out of Seattle as his, his campaign consultancy group. So he's, uh, he's bringing in some big guns. They've done a lot of campaigns in Alaska. They know the scene very well. And they filed his FEC reports for him. And he did a very bizarre rollout yesterday at the 49th Street Brewery down in Ship Creek. Uh, he had a room full of people. They were all behind masks. And then he, 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 uh, their, their Facebook live streams kind of failed. A lot of people just didn't see it. I think that what they did, and you know this environment better than I did, maybe they just limited it to a, a, a very small number of people who could watch so that they could avoid getting negative comments during the live stream. I have a feeling they controlled it pretty well. Yeah. And, but the, the live stream that they posted afterwards saying, in case you missed it, was extremely grainy and the sound quality was very, very poor. And it almost makes it look to me like they just sort of faked the whole thing up. I'm sorry, it just didn't look like they really succeeded on their live stream. Yeah, this is, uh, I'm actually, super excited that he's in the race because it is going to spice things up. It's he's, uh, <laughs> He is, he is, um, you know, I think maybe part of the strategy of the Democrats is uh, they, they probably have a professional in their other candidate and they're going to have somebody who's going to be way outside the box with, with constant. And he's going to say and do things that probably most candidates wouldn't do. He's going to react the way most candidates wouldn't do. So it's probably like a petri, petri dish, dish scenario for them to see, you know, what happens when we put a candidate out there that's not a Dr. Gross or a, somebody who's super well polished, but is a little bit of the Democrats version of Trump gets out there and just says whatever he wants. And it is going to be entertaining, to say the least, because, you know, he's on record uh, uh, saying, you know, verbally basically verbally assaulting you, Suzanne, saying very horrible things. He said it to other people. He votes with them. He votes with his emotions. One of the last votes he did that we captured was when uh, assembly member Jamie Allard uh, submitted a map uh, to the assembly and they were debating on whether they're going to accept this map or not. And Jamie was stating her case and stating the facts of her case and constant kept interrupting her, kept interrupting her, kept interrupting her. And, and Jamie finally just said, can you please let me finish? It seems unfair that you're letting me finish. And, and she finally got to finish. And then at the very end, you know, it has to be his show. And so he stated, you know, I was going to vote for your map to go through, but you hurt my feelings by questioning my integrity. And so now I'm not going to, and it's right. just like, what, how much more elementary juvenile can we get when we're literally telling the public, I'm no longer voting for things based on facts. I'm voting for things based off you if somebody's hurt me. my feelings and if they were mean to me or not. And it's going to be, I think it's going to be epic to see and watch his campaign uh, because again, it's going to be entertaining. I don't think he has a chance in winning at all. Uh, but we'll see with the ranked choice voting. I don't proclaim to be a ranked choice voting expert by any means, but I don't think that uh, he'll be winning this one this time around. I suppose not. I mean, it is, uh, it, uh, it's, it's brave of him to put himself up there for examination, especially with the, the incredible history that is out there on him, all the things that he has said on the record. And then I noticed that he uh, completely dismantled his Twitter account, his, his personal Twitter account. There was a lot of stuff on there that was uh, really rich material for opposition. I don't know if any pick, anybody actually picked <laughs> through it and, and grabbed any of it. 
And I've got a few things from the past and there's no point in, in, um, in using it because I don't think he's going to go anywhere. But he is the Democrat's Democrat. I thought it's fascinating, though, that the, on the Democratic Party's uh, f- uh, Facebook page, they, they ignored it, basically. On their website, they're still pushing L.B. Gray Jackson for Senate. They never mentioned it. They didn't say, look, we have a candidate for Congress like they did for LV. They did a big rollout for LV. Oh, yeah. and, and they just completely ignored Chris Constant on their page. And then they all they kind of did on their Twitter feed is sort of retweet what he'd done and just sort of retweet it and move on. They didn't they didn't spend much time on it. And um, let's see, what, what else do we have going on on the website? I, last night I did the, the story on the, the redistricting board. And, and for those who don't know what redistricting is, it's where every 10 years we, get, we do the census. And then we have to go through and redraw the political line so that every district is roughly got the same amount of population. And that's not easy in any state. It's especially tricky in Alaska because we're so big and we've got these We've got a very bizarre shape. We've got this long panhandle down in Southeast, and then we have this long sweep of the Aleutians, and we have these massive areas that nobody lives in, but you've still got to capture the three people that live in a, you know, a camp somewhere and include them into a district somewhere. So what, we don't have to do congressional districts because we only have one seat, but we do have to do state house and Senate districts. And uh, that's been going on since last year. After the census released its numbers in August uh, for the, you know, the, its official numbers for the state, the Alaska Redistricting Board started getting going and they started meeting very consistently and, and presenting maps and arguing. And some of these arguments were very contentious and there were, you know, hot emotions. So you've got two kind of hardcore Democrats. Now they aren't registered Democrats, but they align with Democrats. And in this state, that's typical. We don't see people actually signing up for the Democratic Party, although 75,000 people have. But by and large, a lot of Democrats just, they just check the nonpartisan box because they just don't want people to know. So we've got two people on that redistricting board who are hardcore Democrats. And then we have um, a couple that are Republicans. And uh, basically it is, it, it leans a slightly Republican, five people on the board. One is picked, two picked by the governor, one picked by the Senate president that was picked by Kathy Giesel uh, when she was Senate president. One was picked by Bryce Edgmond, the House Speaker, when he was House Speaker. And then one picked by um, very, very liberal Chief Justice Joel Bolger, who's no longer Chief Justice because he kind of, he kind of messed it up for himself. Um, and then the, the maps are drawn. They take them around the state. There are 20 public hearings, people put input in, and then they, they finally draw a final map, they vote on it, and it, it passes three to two. No surprise, the conservatives win on their map. And then of course, the, uh, there were these lawsuits over it. There were something like five lawsuits filed. And to get around to the point here, while they're deliberating on these maps, while they're actually deliberating and voting, there is a sixth person that is involved in this map making. It is a hidden person. And you can go to mustreadalaska.com and check this out. It's Senator Tom Begich, who is sending text messages back and forth with Nicole Baromio, who was one of the Democrat picks. And she was picked by Bryce Edgman. And he is telling her what to look for, what to do, how to try to manipulate uh, the Republican uh, Bud Simpson how to push back on the Republican Bethany Markham, um, how to say things to set up for a lawsuit later, you know, bring up the race thing. It it might not work, but it's good to have it on the record for uh, for a lawsuit. And all of these things were in uh, text messages. So when I was watching the the court challenge, there was a court challenge that went uh, with all these maps and they combined them into one court challenge in front of Judge Matthews. And he, he sent back to the board, he wants them to look at the Juno Skagway House District lines, and he wants them to look at the, uh, the Senate lines for Eagle River Muldoon. And all the other, the, those are the, the liberal challenges that he wants them to look at again. In other words, he voted in favor of the liberals on the liberal challenges, and he ignored the other ones that were conservative challenges. It was very biased, very political. But he had these these text messages, they had been submitted as part of the record. 
and you know, in his long, extensive explanation of his decision, he never mentioned the fact that there was a sixth person who was essentially operating behind the scenes, texting in real time with one of the members of the redistricting board and giving her instructions on what to do, such as ask them, you know, he, he said, ask them, what do you think is wrong with Nicole's Anchorage map? Please tell us what's wrong. And so you, you can go back on the record and you can find that section of tape in November where Nic Nicole and Melanie Bonke are saying, tell us what's wrong with Nicole's map. Well, tell us what's wrong with the map. They were doing exactly what he told them to do. The judge never mentioned it in any of his discussions. So I realized that it had been submitted as part of court record. And so I did a, a public records request and I got the, the text messages yesterday. So if you go to mustrelasco.com, you can read the text messages and it's kind of, uh, kind of a little bit in the weeds. It's not for everybody. It's not as, as uh, fun as writing about trucker things and Chris Constant capers and stuff, but it's uh, super important for the political districts of the state, especially in a state that is uh, essentially conservative, but it's being redrawn by a judge to be more liberal. So John, what did you think about that? Yeah, it's like a top secret you know, coercion happening right in front of our eyes. Just imagine if, you know, the Supreme Court of Alaska had some monumental decision on, you know, let's say abortion or capital punishment or something like that. And, and you had somebody text messaging the Supreme Court justice on what to say, how to say it, how to rule, or just imagine the same scenario of the redistricting board meeting and Governor Dunleavy texting one of the Republicans on the board exactly what to say, exactly how to say it, exactly, you know, nuances of trying to get this person or that person to budge a little bit. It's the other team historically is always way more smarter than us, unfortunately. And this just goes to show that they found a way to not necessarily break the law. I don't think it's illegal, but I do think it's in bad taste and poor judgment. And they will do it and pat themselves on the back and give themselves high fives. And, you know, he'll probably get some sort of medal from his party for doing this. And we're just sitting here kind of twiddling our thumbs, trying to figure out, you know, uh, how this thing all works. Meanwhile, they've mapped out everything and they've got lawyers ready and all oh, this yeah. kind of stuff. Yeah, They've got and all so the lawyers. This is just another example where I, I, you know, if you're listening to this and you live in your town, you know, this is a prime example on why to get involved now at a local level, because they've been doing this for years and years and years and years and years, and they get people involved. You know, this just speaks to the enormous problem of the lack of conservatives involved in the, you know, everything from PTA to running for governor. And if you are out there and you have a little extra time, I really want to encourage you to get involved because we need to start thinking long term with uh, with our team instead of always being so mindful of short term stuff, you know, let's figure out how to win the next five elections as opposed to getting pissed off that somebody told you to wear a mask. All right, uh, you know, and, and um, you bring up you, you know, you bring up bring up a really good point, John. Can you imagine if if text had come out that uh, Mike Dunley, the governor of Alaska, had been texting with somebody on the redistricting board in the middle of their deliberations, in the middle of their voting, in the middle of their final map making, the final uh, 10 days of map making. There's all kinds of text messages going back and forth between the governor of Alaska and, and the redistricting board, a, a member. Can you imagine what the media would do with oh that? Oh, my gosh. The Anchorage Daily News editorial board would, would have held 27 special sessions. Yep. And wrote up, you know, 14 different books on why Dunleavy is the worst person in the world and that everybody's going to hell. And anybody right. ever associated with Dunleavy is now, you know, needs to be kicked out of the state of Alaska for yeah, hating, hating, you know, everything that the democracy stands for. And they would have, you know, plastered all these people on the front page news for the next seven years. Uh, but the other t the other team does it and, you know, they get a high five. So there it yeah. is. Nothing, absolutely nothing, crickets. And so, the, you know, this is the hypocrisy, of course, of the mainstream media. I don't think we're going to, you know, even though we, we broke the story, we're not going to hear anything from them about it.
Well, let's, um, uh, you know, we're going to run out of time here. I just want to um, you know, talk a little bit about the the campaign finance reports. The year start reports were due on the 15th, and that shows everybody who's interested in politics how much money the different candidates in Alaska, and I'm talking about the, um, you know, the House seats, the gubernatorial seats, how much money people have been able to acquire for their campaigns up until February 1. And in other words, it's the start of the year, and the APOC, Alaska Public Offices Commission, you know, uh, wants everybody to know how much everybody's got at the beginning of this cycle. And it was really interesting. I did a story on it, and it showed that Bill Walker ha- and Les Guerra have a monster treasury between them. Oh, man, they're kicking butt. Yeah, and it's like between the two of them, it's like $1.2 million. And that's that's a lot of money for those those two candidates. For one thing, Bill Walker is a non-party candidate. And to have that amount of money available to him so soon is really interesting. And then to see Les Guerra, who is uh, such a minor candidate, he's a Democrat, but he's such a minor candidate. He's so uh, poorly thought of in general to be able to say that he's got $550,000. $500,000 is crazy. It is really, really stunning. And so um, that they, start the, they start the year with a lot of money. Uh, Bill Walker is, is, is hiring staff. In fact, speaking of the redistricting board, he has hired the deputy director of the Alaska redistricting board to be his campaign manager. Oh, tell me this is not a Oh my gosh. Uh-huh. These, and they're, they're going to hire the best of the best in Alaska and in the you know, lower 48, they're going to have all these campaign strategy people on their staff and, you know, the guru from DC and the guru from Seattle and, and the guru from California. And I just hope to God that at least one Republican ticket gets to hiring some folks that know how to run these big campaigns, because just from a practical standpoint, I see governor uh, former Governor Walker stuff all over Facebook all the time. Some, you know, he's he's target doing ads or he's doing something to have make it pop up on my Facebook all the time. I don't see any of Dunleavy stuff anywhere at any given moment, and that's a problem because the average person is on their Facebook. I don't know six hours a day. That's where Governor Dunleavy's team needs to be living on that yeah. Facebook posting about what they're excited about. Because one thing we do know for sure is that conservatives will come out and vote if they're pissed off about something. <laughs> and that's how, you know, SB 91 and the permanent fund got them last time to come out and vote for Dunleavy. And I don't know what that, that thing is going to be for this election cycle. And that has me worried about Walker and the other folks because we don't have that thing that's going to get conservatives to come out and vote. I don't know what that thing is yet. And that's worrisome to me. Yeah, it's a little bit worrisome. And in, in terms of uh, where the state is, you know, people vote emotionally. And, and unfortunately, they don't always sit down and analyze things. And they don't think five years ahead, like you were saying before. They vote emotionally based on things in the moment. And uh, I, I don't see Dunleavy's team getting stepping up and doing anything it feels like they are going to allow their competitors to fill the void for them and right now they created a massive void because they're so kind of busy i don't know what they're doing but there's no evidence of a campaign for dunleavy it looks to me like he has just decided that he's going to manage his campaign and let me tell you if you are your own campaign manager you have an idiot for a campaign manager it's not how you do it put that on a bumper sticker (laughs) <laughs> You've got to find somebody who will tell you today you're going to make uh, you're going to make fundraising calls for two hours and then you're going to sit down for an hour and write thank you notes and then we've got three events you're going to go to tonight and yes you're going to do that here's your suit. You've got to have somebody who has enough mojo that they can get that uh, candidate to sort of do things the candidate isn't likely to want to do himself, especially somebody like Dunleavy who is a natural introvert. He just you know he, he he's not lazy. He just is an introvert. He doesn't necessarily want to go out and, and shake hands and, and glad hand. He's a policy wonk is what he is. He likes the policy thing. And my goodness, when you talk to him, that's what he's all about. And so he likes governing, but I don't think he likes running. And so that's a different kind of person. 
And I will say that uh, he is going to allow people like Chris Kirka, and Charlie Kirk, Charlie, oh, look, I, I call him Charlie Kirk. That's good. <laughs> and Charlie Pierce. Yeah, Charlie Kirk. That would be nice. Uh, Charlie Pierce to fill the void that he has created. So uh, Dunleavy's got some work to do to uh, to get back up on his mule and start talking to Alaskans and reconnecting with them. So we'll see what he what he does. But right now, his campaign looks very weak, very uninspiring, and um, it's, like you said, uh, Bill Walker's all over the place, and he Bill Walker will melt down eventually. There's too much dirt on him. He's trying to build. I don't yeah. think that I'm, I'm not really worried about him, but anyway, it's uh, we're moving into that cycle. So, so today is our you know first day of doing what we said we were going to do, John. We said this year we're going to start doing our show on Facebook Live, and I just want to thank you for getting us going on that because. We, here it is in the middle of February, and we're finally doing it. I thought we'd do it in January. We just didn't get around to it. It's so exciting, I, and, and uh, I'm, I'm super glad that we did it. One little small piece of news before we end off here, and you take us away, is um, I'm sure we'll hear more about this, but uh, the scuttlebutt is that in the Sarah Palin trial, which, or, um, which we've all kind of seen and read about, is that the, some of the jurors knew beforehand about the judge judge's kind of preemptive verdict, which is just another piece of a crazy puzzle that uh, will unwind right in front of our eyes, I guess. Right. I didn't have time to get to that story, but you're absolutely right. Uh, several of the jurors have said that they knew in advance that the judge had said he was, that if they, if they convict, voted uh, against the New York Times, that he would throw the case out. And so if several of them knew, that means all of them knew. They all knew that the judge had already predecided the case. So this is, I mean, it gives her a big opening to challenge it. And I hope she does. I hope she has the, the financial wherewithal to challenge this because I know going to court in New York and Manhattan and so forth is very expensive, but, oh, yeah. but um, I hope she challenges it because that is not justice. What we saw, and that really weakens our judicial system when judges get it in front of the jury and say, Whatever you do, remember, I'm throwing it out. Yeah, that's uh, not good. <laughs> no, that's not good at all. Well, listen, uh, we're way into our, our half hour time. I just really want to thank everybody for your support for Must Read Alaska. It means a tremendous amount to us. Thank you for taking the time to spend with John and I today. If you're supportive of Must Read Alaska, I really, really appreciate it. There's all these little gizmos that we end up having to pay for just to keep this thing operating. And what this is all about is just making sure that the right side of the news is standing up strong. Next time the left comes at the right, we have a voice, we have a way to fight back, we have a way to correct the record. And that's why we keep going every single day. And we are here every single day. You've got news and you've got information coming to you from three newsletters a week and daily content at mustreadalaska.com. Our show that we're, we're, uh, we took a little break from, we haven't done for a, a lot of them for a couple of weeks, but we're going to start doing them live on Facebook and also on our other, on our other uh, channels. John, what other channels are we on? We're like on Spotify and. Yeah, we're on Spotify and uh, iHeartRadio, uh, Amazon Music, which if you have an Alexa, you can ask it to play it. If you have a Google Home bot, you can ask Google Home to play it. If you have a, uh, I if you have Apple TV, you can play it from Apple TV. Pretty much anywhere there's music, our uh, our podcast or our show is available, and we're pretty excited that at one point you know we're in the top 200 usually for iTunes for our category. At one point we were ranked number 37 in the entire U.S. in our category, which puts us at the top ranked uh, uh, one of the top ranked iTunes podcasts in Alaska in the history of Alaska, which we're pretty excited about our little podcasts that we're kind of doing from our own unique living room. So <laughs> yep, 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 yep. we're not, we're just a shoestring operation here, but if you want to help us out, just hit that donate button on the right side of mustrelaska.com. There's a, I try to put buttons everywhere to help, to help remind people that um, there are costs involved. And I appreciate you keeping the lights on here at Must Read Alaska until next week, John and I are signing off from somewhere in Alaska. Thanks guys. Thanks. <laughs>